Romans 1 through 3, Paul proved that we are sinner, sinners by choice. He started with us understanding natural law. What is natural law? Uh, you, everyone knows and, and is guilty for the sin that they're aware of. Then he went and progressed to sin's outcome. What is the progression of sin and what's the outcome of it where God gave him over to reprobate mind? And then he went understanding the written law. So this was to the Hebrews. He said, you think you're better because you have a written law. Understand that the written law makes you more responsible than the, than the uh, um, uh, Gentiles were. And then he, he finalized this in chapter 3 with all are irrefutably guilty before God. That was, for we see all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, was how he ended that section. So he started with what it is to be a man, and he's brought us forward to every man has sinned. Chapter 3, he introduces, praise God, the grace of God. He introduced saved by grace. He starts with substitutional righteousness. Right there in 325, he talks about God declaring his righteousness for us. And then third-party payment. He describes what it is to have a third party pay for your, your sin, your guilt, and, and, and goes over that in detail. And then righteousness through faith. Now, this was a novel concept to the Jews, but he, he introduced it with, with such... Um, alacrity that, that they, couldn't, they couldn't argue with it the way he had addressed it. And finally, with historical evidence in chapter 4 of grace. So he went back to Abraham and, and how this uh, Abraham was saved not just by his works, but by God's grace on him because of his faith in God. And then Romans 5 through 8, he talks about being sanctified. Now again, we haven't changed our conversation here. It's a continuation of what he started. So 5 through 8, he talks a about what it means to be sanctified. Chapter 5, he gave us the background theory. Chapter 6, what we're free from. Chapter 7 is an illustration of the freedom that we have in Christ. We'll go over this in a little more detail. And chapter 8, which we're getting into now, is so now what? So we're introduced as people, lost people, saved people. What does that mean now in our, in our lives what is an illustration of what that looks like? Now what? That's what we're getting into in chapter 8. Now jumping back to chapter 5 in a little more detail, he introduces two kingdoms. The first kingdom he introduces, he says, is Adam. It's, it's that you're born of Adam, of, of his race. That he's your progenitor. And in this kingdom is, is uh, quantified. It's, it's, it's the, the, the way you would describe it is sin, death, and darkness. That's the kingdom of Adam, the kingdom of man. And everyone has capitulated to that. And then he introduces a new kingdom. He says that we're a new creature in Christ. The second Adam, the last man, it's Jesus. And that kingdom is represented in life, light, and righteousness. Now, the first kingdom would be born of Adam or of the flesh or of water, depending on where we look at it. The second man or the second the, the being born again is being born again in Jesus or by the Spirit of God. And that borns you into life, light, and righteousness. The reason this is the foundation of sanctification is because he's describing how you've been removed from that kingdom and placed into this kingdom. You've been removed from the kingdom of death and replaced into the kingdom of life, and it's the foundation of sanctification. Chapter 6, he talks about practical theory. If we're free from sin, should we just go for it? Absolutely not. And then applied theory, what does that look like in our life, that righteousness? And then spiritual inducement toward the last part. He says, listen, here's the reason that you want to obey God. So you see we've moved from a new creation, what that means, how you become a new creation. You're sanctified. Now what? How do you act? So spiritual inducement is God's born you again. Don't go back to the garbage. And finally, a fleshly inducement. And that is that, that before the way that you acted, the outcome of that was obviously death. It messed everything up. Don't go back to that. Don't be like a dog returning to its vomit. When, when you get out of the world and you're born again, don't go back to the same things that hurt you before. And then he goes into chapter 7. Now, chapter 7, he starts with a marriage illustration. And the reason for that is you were under the one law, and now you're under the other law. And he covers that in detail. And then he defends the law. In other words, he says the law was not the problem. You were the problem. And he goes over that in some detail, his defense of the law. And finally, 
the deficiency of the flesh, he finishes up chapter 7 with, you understand the law, you want to keep the law, you recognize that the law is good, but you have flesh that wants other stuff, and so you have this, this problem between the flesh and the spirit. And then he, he ends up with that you are uh, overcoming because of who you are in Christ. Now, birthrights. Chapter 8 is all about birthrights. In other words, the other was where you've been. Now what? Looking forward, what's your birthright? The beginning of chapter 8, which we'll get into, he's contrasting the flesh and the spirit. He's saying this is what it looked like in the flesh. This is what it looks like in the spirit. Then he's going to talk about who you are now. In other words, you're no longer the guy that was living for the flesh. Now you're a guy that has a mind for the spirit. You're living for the spirit. Then he's going to talk about the freedom that we have in the spirit of Christ. What, is that, what does that look like in our life? What does it look like lived out? Nowhere in this is Paul saying, I want you to do this. He's saying, this is who you are. And it's important to understand our, our flow through the book because we get into chapter 8 and it's often taught, this is what you need to do in order to have salvation. It's, it's ironic, the same people that will teach We'll, we'll teach that. Well, you get another crowd that's teaching the same passage from the opposite side. You can live like hell and do whatever you want, and, and you're still saved because of this. The other passage says you need a struggle to be obedient so that you don't go to hell, and it's the same passage. It's like the word cleave. It's like if a young husband comes to you and says, I'm going to cleave to my wife, and you say, congratulations. You know, that's what the preacher said, cleave to your wife. The same husband comes to you carrying a big knife, kind of a crazy look in his eyes, and he goes, I'm going to cleave my wife. You tackle the guy. You tackle him. You hold him down. You know, we're going to put you in the loony bin. Why? What's the difference? Is it the word two? Two letters. The word two changes the entire context. You need to understand context. Is he carrying a knife and got a crazy look in his eye? Or does he look like he's in love with his wife? Because it matters. The context matters. So what you have is people from both sides here. They come along and they grab the one and they say, well, I'm going to teach this or no, I'm going to teach that. When the, you, the thing that's important is to understand what's the context of what's going on. Suffering because of the birthright, chapter, or verse 18 of chapter 8, he's going to talk about because of who you are in Christ, you're going to suffer. And that leads into the next section, a hope for deliverance. It's a very small passage of the suffering that will take place because we hope for something better. And then he's going to talk about patience while we wait. You see, this is a letter that's written to saints that he's encouraging. What a beautiful chapter of encouragement. Continuing on, intimacy while we wait. There's intimacy with the Spirit. While we're waiting for the bridegroom to come and take us back to his home, back to glory, back to the marriage of the Lamb, while we're waiting, there's an intimacy with his Spirit that we know that he loves us because his banner over us is love. And finally, making sense of the suffering there in verse 28, he's going to say there's a reason for that suffering, that God has got something that he's doing in you. And then remembering who you are in chapters, I mean, verses 29 and 30, that's a, that's a beautiful reminder. That's what Don was talking about. Remember who you are in Christ. And the very best for last, remember who he is in the end of chapter 8. So you can see from the, from the outset to the where we're going to get in chapter 8 today, the, the context of what we're going to be in.